we just brushed up on malnutrition in one of my classes and there was absolutely no mention of eating disorders. And to me, that's crazy. I don't understand why it's not mentioned. Hello, welcome to The Seasoned RD, a podcast connecting newer professionals in the field of eating disorders to those of us who have been around for a while. I'm your host, Beth Harrell, a certified eating disorders registered dietitian and supervisor. And I'm Abby Brown, a registered dietitian who is newer to the field. I think of myself as a well-seasoned cast iron skillet with wisdom and experience, yet always ready for something new. And I think of myself as an Instapot with innovation and a fresh perspective. This podcast brings both to the table to share ingredients, recipes, and techniques of past and present so we can all be our best for the future. The kettle is heating up. The skillet is on simmer. So join us around the table for true professional nourishment. Abby, ready to stir the pot? Let's do it. Today we got to talk to Kendra Tanis, and she has so many great things for us today. And one great question she had is, how can discussions in school talk about malnutrition without talking about eating disorders? Great question, Kendra. And so in order to learn the things that she has decided that she's leaning towards, she said you have to make sacrifices and prioritize things that are more important for you to learn. So if you're not totally into the biochemistry of vitamin D, but you are into learning what compassionate dietetics and personal training is about, listen to this podcast episode and check in with all of the links, any of the links that Kendra has given us today. Her bio is in the show notes, but I just want to say that she came to the field of dietetics with a psychology undergrad degree, so she is not new to the area of psychology, and she's going to be a mover and a shaker in this world. She already is, and she wants to be a non-diet dietitian, helping patients to recover from chronic dieting and disordered eating. All of the organizations that she's part of, including Anti-Diet Dietetic Students Organization and ASDA, the Association of Size Diversity and Health. I think that the show note links in this episode are going to be bigger than any other episode that we have and maybe even of all of combined. So we just can't see where Kendra is going to take this, especially after she becomes board eligible to sit for her exam in spring of 2022. We're going to follow along. Welcome, Kendra. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. We have a few questions that we just like kind of as icebreakers to get to know you a little bit. And Abby, you want to start with the first one? Yes. Okay. And I, I love this question. I think everybody has such a unique opinion on this, but mountains or beach, what do you prefer? Oh, mountains for sure. Um, <laughs> I'm probably biased actually, because I'm from Arizona. So like I'm surrounded by mountains. Uh-huh, um, nice. But yeah, I don't, I don't really like sand. I am the same. I think Abby, I forget what you are. I'm on beach all the way. Yeah. I'm the same with mountains and not really loving the sand. Okay. Okay. And audio book or paper book? Paper book. I like to mark pages and actually I'm reading through the book sick enough right now. Oh yeah. It has like a hundred tabs in it because I've just been marking every page. Kendra, I'm so glad you brought up Sick Enough. Back in, when I started in this field about 30 years ago, we didn't have anything for dietitians. And when that came out, I told Dr. G, this is like the dietitian's Bible. We have been waiting for this. And I bought, I don't know, I think I still have several copies and I'll give them to doctors sometimes um, with my business card in there to say, here, this is what I need you to know. Yeah, it's really important. I'm really glad that I'm reading it. Awesome. I agree. I'm a a paper girl as well. And I feel like as our world is becoming more and more virtual, I don't always think we're sticking with the audiobooks, even though we're becoming virtual. I think so many of us still really appreciate the paper. And then another question I have for you, Kendra, breakfast or dinner? What do you prefer? Probably breakfast. When Mm -hmm. I was a kid, my mom would call me breakfast girl. (laughs) Okay. <laughs> every weekend I always woke up and like that was the first thing I wanted was just a big breakfast so mm-hmm. yeah. nice I don't know and I, I like breakfast for dinner so there's my answer Abby <laughs> a little combo there I can respect yes. that I'm I'm the same way breakfast food all the way so 
breakfast girl. And that's why you became a dietitian, which is actually our next question, not necessarily why you became, but we always say breakfast is the most important meal of the day. So you obviously started out that way as a kid, knowing that, you know, breakfast was your favorite. So what got you into this field? And is this the first field that you've actually pursued? Oh gosh, it's been a long road. I started out, I guess, in my undergrad, I was studying nutrition, but when I was studying nutrition in my undergrad, it was sort of from like a less healthy perspective. It was more like, if I learn about nutrition, then I'll have more control over my body and I'll help everybody to achieve this like ideal. But when I got to organic chemistry in my undergrad, I realized that the classes were just getting really heavy and I ended up switching to psychology actually. So I graduated with a degree in psychology and just kind of floundered about a little bit after my undergrad trying to figure out what to do with my life. And I ended up getting certified as a personal trainer and as a yoga teacher and began working one-on-one with clients in the fitness industry. And over time, I started to realize that my clients weren't making the progress that I thought that I was helping them to make. Like people would lose a few pounds and then they would just regain it. And I thought that that was sort of my failure as a fitness professional. But I finally discovered the book Intuitive Eating and I (laughs) kind of put the pieces together and I was like, oh, it's actually not a fault on my part, but it's just the system as a whole that doesn't really work. So I applied to grad school to go back to nutrition and become a dietitian. And here we are. Yeah. So where are we? Go ahead and tell us where you are in your learning process towards becoming a dietitian. Okay. So I'm in a combined master's program. So I do my master's coursework and my internship at the same time at Hunter College in New York City. Although due to COVID, it's been remote this whole time. I am in my spring semester of my first year. So I have my clinical rotation this summer, and then I have another year of coursework and research, and I'll be graduating spring 2022. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious because you have come through psychology and coming from a less healthy perspective as you started out, that as you're going through the dietetics training as a more experienced person in this field, what are you learning? How are you? Are they doing a good job? And I don't want to call out any particular schools or people, but if you have shout outs for people who are helping you besides intuitive eating, which yes, um, that's actually a required course or reading if someone wants to become certified as an eating disorders registered dietitian. But I think everyone needs to know about intuitive eating. So are there good things within your training? Are there things that frustrate you? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes and yes. <laughs> okay. So looking at the program that I'm in, I mean, it certainly teaches you nutrition. I think that that's, I mean, you have to learn about nutrition if you're going to be a dietitian. I understand that. Unfortunately, so far, there's no coursework covering intuitive eating, health at every size, even weight stigma, really. And I just think that it's so important that programs start incorporating these things because it seems to me that you have to incorporate those concepts if you want to provide compassionate care to your patients. Although I'm not getting much of that in my program, I am. I found over the summer this club, I guess it's more of an organization called Anti-Diet Dietetic Students on Instagram. And they are amazing. It's founded by two girls. One goes to Queens College and one goes to NYU. And they felt the same way. You know, coursework, it's just not covering these concepts. So we have dietitians in the non-diet field come every other week and they discuss how they use the non-diet approach in their practice and they discuss eating disorders. And so I feel like I'm getting a lot out of that. I helped to arrange a webinar last month and I attended that one. It was amazing. There were over 600 people on it, I think. Yeah. uh, With Christy Harrison was one of the main speakers. So um, it's just been really awesome that I do have that place to turn when I'm feeling kind of isolated in my program. Mm -hmm. That leads me into a question I was going to ask about you because you have this really awesome Instagram account. And when I was scrolling through it, I was thinking, 
Wow. Kendra is very informed. She knows a lot about intuitive eating and, you know, even just the dialogue and the way you phrase things is so, it's so right. It's, I feel like, like I said, you're very informed. And so would you say that those resources you are using now is what's helping you fuel your Instagram account? Yeah, I guess it started off in the summer. I was kind of trying to get excited about my program and going to grad school. And so I was looking for a podcast to listen to. And I started to listen to RD Real Talk with Heather Kaplan. And there was this episode, or I guess, what would you even call it? <laughs> an episode, <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> with Shauna Spence. And her Instagram handle is The Nutrition Tea. And I had never heard of the non-diet approach before then. And so just hearing her talk about everything, it was like discovering the instruction manual for this thing that I have been trying to build. And so everything sort of just fell into place. So in that episode, she recommended that to dive deeper, you read intuitive eating and anti-diet. I did. And I started out on my path to become an intuitive eating counselor. I'm actually starting module two next month with Evelyn Triboli. So I guess I just, I just like to read and I like to learn more. And as a result, people in my life ask me questions about these things. And so I create posts to explain them. And I try really hard to be like a real person online. I don't want to be this fake person on Instagram. So I think kind of meshing all those things together is how I spit out my content. <laughs> oh my well, gosh. I think that you're doing everything that you are trying to do, I think is absolutely working on all levels. It seems very real. And, you know, it's just such a good space for people to be in. I want to, you know, I wish everybody could see your account because what you say is so helpful. And then just speaking of that, there are a couple of posts I would love to get more of your opinion on. So one, one of your posts, I really liked, there are a few slides, but just one sentence you said is using intuitive eating as a weight loss tool is not intuitive eating. It is the hunger slash fullness diet. So, I mean, you're absolutely correct. Those two cannot live in the same world together, but I would love for you to explain that a little bit more. Yeah. I think the biggest thing to realize is intuitive eating is so much about like letting go because we have these ideas of how our body quote unquote should look and how we should eat if we're going to be healthy. And by letting go of all of these rules, you sort of like open up all of this free space. So if you're looking at intuitive eating, like this thing you have to do with the ultimate goal to lose weight, you're kind of like still keeping yourself in a little bit of a cage and not giving yourself the freedom to make peace with food and challenge the food police and move forward with intuitive eating. Mm, I love that. Yeah. Oh, and I, I know Abby, you may have some more questions too, because you have more Instagram things. So I'll let you go through those, but I want to wrap back around to something that Kendra said earlier when you're finished. Okay. Yeah. So actually one more, one more post. I mean, I loved all of your posts, but one more that I would love a further, <laughs> to further talk about. I thought this one was great. You said body respect is not learning to love your appearance. It's learning to nourish your physical, mental, and emotional self, no matter your appearance. And again, is when you say it, it doesn't sound difficult, but to actually believe that and to practice that and to live that out, it's, it's hard. So yeah, if you could explain that one a little more too. Yeah. I recently read a book by the Kite Sisters called More Than a Body. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that book. I'm not. Oh, it's amazing. But they, it's basically all about body image. And their main point in the book is body image is not about how you look. It's about knowing that your body is good no matter what you look like. So when when you think about body respect, it's really the same. It's not about how you look. It's about how you take care of yourself and how you check in with yourself on, from the inside. I think that our society just places so much emphasis on, you know, appearing healthy. And, you know, if you have the plate with the right things on it, then you must be healthy, even though you could 
be really struggling on the inside. And I think that it's just a much better approach to respect your body first. And you might get to a place where you love your body too and love how it looks, but that's ultimately not the point, I guess. Mm. Wow. Okay. So when you said the instruction manual that I've been trying to develop, this was intuitive eating is what you're describing. That's like a gold mine of all of the things that you've been in your heart, just trying to put words to and intuitive eating has become that way. And I have to tell you, even though I've been in the field for 30 years and been using intuitive eating principles for about the past 23, this is the first time, and I'm a certified eating disorder specialist and supervisor, right? I've been doing this work inpatient, outpatient um, for a very long time. I'm just now in the intuitive eating counseling. So I am I will be by April next month, an intuitive eating certified intuitive eating counselor. So are you in those sessions right now with Evelyn? Yeah. So I'm starting the webinar in April and then I'll have just the one-on-one coaching to do probably over the summer. So sometime in 2021. Yay. I know, but it's such a land, it's such a a springboard for all of the things that we do. And I mentioned that intuitive eating is one of the required books for if someone who wants to become a certified eating disorders, registered dietitian. And you had mentioned that our dietetics programs really don't prepare or any programs, our health and wellness programs, they really don't prepare people to do this kind of work. And you discovered that. So I think you had another stat maybe about dietetics programs and how few actually, you know, we need to talk about disordered eating. Yeah, there is a study actually I posted maybe for the anti-diet dietetic students. Sometimes I post for them too. I'm on their social media, so I get confused sometimes. But there was a study done and a survey was sent out to dietitians and nutrition professionals in several different areas. I can't tell you exactly. I would have to brush up on the study. But when they got the results back, they found that 77% of nutrition professionals feel that eating disorders are a concern in dietetics programs among the students, but only, I think it was 12 or 15% of them actually have procedures in place to deal with those problems. Mm -hmm. So it's this big blank area that's not being addressed. Yeah. My whole goal in this podcast, and and I reached out to Heather Kaplan too, because I really appreciated her segment on supervision. And when I'm interviewing the seasoned RDs, the ones who have been around for a while, I ask them, how did you get into supervision? Why did you get into supervision? And you'll hear many of them say, I was resistant to it, or I was, I just felt found it through the therapy realm, because as a psychology undergrad, you probably were made aware that if, if someone were becoming licensed, they had to go through a supervision period before they could be fully licensed. Mm-hmm. Dietitians don't have that. Yeah. It is so like, we're just supposed to hang our hat and put ourselves out there as eating, dis- you know, that we work with eating disorders, as well as GI complications, as well as type one diabetes, as well as non-alcoholic fatty liver disease as well, you know, so that there's not a training, we have knowledge, but we don't have that like guided experience. Yeah, it's actually, it's really concerning. We just brushed up on malnutrition in one of my classes and they're talking about Quashercore and Marasmus, but they, there was absolutely no mention of eating disorders. And to me, that's crazy. We're talking <laughs> about malnutrition. <laughs> so yeah. I, I just don't understand why it's not mentioned. Yeah. You know, it's, thank you for bringing that up because malnutrition, I, one of my big soapboxes is, is what's commonly known as atypical anorexia, which is not atypical at all. It's very typical. Most people who struggle with anorexia are in uh, average size bodies or even larger than average size bodies. And they're missed by us, by the, you mentioned your physical fitness, by even, even some some yoga teachers are more like burn and and whatever. And that's not the intent. We know that yoga is one of the evidence-based 
activities for people with eating disorders, but there are so many different types of yoga. Anyway, back to malnutrition. Now we have nutrition focused physical exams, which I don't know if you've gotten to yet, but when I did the three hour course, when I worked at a children's hospital, I asked the instructor about eating disorders and they don't, there's nothing for them. So I created the top three that I look at when I'm working with someone of all sizes Mm -hmm. to diagnose malnutrition. That's what dietitians can do. We can, that's one contribution we can make. We cannot diagnose eating disorders. And as far as I'm concerned, I tell my patients, I don't care what you call it. It's pretty much if you are feeling craziness in your head around your food, eating weight and body, then that's what we're going to work on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Totally agree. And I feel something that I have been learning, you know, at the further I get into this field is that the science is always changing and the hot topic is always changing and our education isn't always as quick to change with it. But my hope is that the more we bring up these conversations and share with each other that we can input more intuitive eating and undergrad or in the internship. And we can talk more about eating disorders and all of those things. It's just, I would love for us to be quicker at it, but that's what's so nice about having all these different groups and having podcasts and Instagram pages like yours to, to share and to continually be learning in that manner. Yeah, definitely. Tell us a little bit more about the anti-diet dietitians on Instagram. And then there was another group that you talked about to connect other newer RDs or RDs to be or um, new RDs or even other professionals, Kendra, because this podcast is for, you might be surprised, physical therapists who, who specialize in eating disorders or strength and conditioning coaches or, of course, therapists, dietitians, any medical providers. Mm-hmm. Well, I did join the Association for Size, Diversity, and Health. So that one, I think think one of the main founders I want to say was Lindo Bacon. Mm-hmm. As to, mm. Yeah. I, you know, I was just looking for larger organizations to join. I know that there's all these big organizations for eating disorders. So I figured there had to be something out there. <laughs> Other than that, I've, I've been doing a lot of reading. I connect with as many people as I can online. I've been sort of connecting with a little potpourri of dietitians. There's a dietitian I'll give a shout out, Um, Rachel Narr in New York. And she specializes in eating disorders and allergies, food allergies. And it was really interesting. She spoke for us at the anti-diet dietetic students meeting. And she said a lot of the time food intolerances are not necessarily food intolerances, but an eating disorder sort of disguised as a food intolerance Mm. because it can lead to like IBS and certain symptoms when you have a lot of anxiety around food. So I did a little bit of collaborating with her and the organization Balance in Manhattan. Mulaney. Yeah, Mulaney Rogers. So she hosted that webinar for us last month. And I will say that Mulaney and then Tammy Beasley, they do a, I don't know if they call it a coffee talk, but it's a closed group. It's a small group of professionals who treat eating disorders and they talk about the most difficult cases. Mm -hmm. And it's not even the most difficult cases. It's the difficult conversations that we have to have, whether we're working with people in an inpatient unit or whether we're working with the parents of a child and the parents are so stuck in diet culture, but the child clearly wants out of it. Mm -hmm. That happens. They don't do it very often, but I really appreciate Balance's approach and their outreach. So these shout outs are amazing because <laughs> some of some of them are actually already on our list. And some of them I work with and I've worked with them for years. And so it'll be a really comfortable conversation. But Rachel Nar, how do you spell her name? N-A-A-R. 
Okay. Because, really down to earth. And- uh huh. Because like the eating disorder and allergies, that is actually a little different of a spin. And we've got Julie Duffy Dillon and Kimmy Singh who work more on the PCOS. I mean, that was kind of a newer area. I remember Julie Duffy Dillon saying that she was looking through what is that green book, Abby, that all dietetic students have? Oh, crap. Oh. Kraus. Kraus. <laughs> and that she was looking through that to see about PCOS. And of course, there wasn't anything in there. And so these are leading. And then Marcy Evans with her, the, the GI, but there's another dietitian who's really big into today. There was a, a topic, trauma, the brain and gut. I guess that's actually tomorrow, but there's there's three or four parts to it. And each one is an hour and the dietitian is doing I mean, trauma, the brain and the gut and this whole idea of trauma and being traumatized by diets and diet culture is huge. Thank you for the shout outs. (laughs) And those are so great for all of us to learn from each other. I think it's awesome when we as healthcare professionals can advocate for the work that another is doing and especially for you know, newer RDs or people, dietetic students, you know, interns to be hearing you talking about these awesome people that you follow, you join in on their groups. That's great. And then they can join in and then we can all share our wealth of knowledge. So it's very evident that you are really interested in intuitive eating. Do you think that this is a counseling is going to be an approach that you want to take once you become a dietitian? Oh, absolutely. I don't think I would want it any other way. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was telling Abby when I was a hospital dietitian and someone was just having open heart surgery and then they're ready to go home and I'm just handing them a a packet of information. How fulfilling is that? Not. Mm -hmm. So the nutrition counseling is a huge piece in your training, because as you had psychology undergrad, but in your nutrition training, have you gotten any nutrition counseling yet? We did do a module with, oh gosh, I forget her name. The The program is called Step by Step, basically just motivational interviewing. Is it Molly Kellogg? Molly Kellogg. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Abby, I know this is how Abby and I connected to because Abby's a new RD as of October of last year. I mean, this is brand new stuff. Mm-hmm. And so these are fun ways that we all get to connect. I love Molly Kellogg. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. There is another woman in Arizona named Dawn Clifford. Um, she is a professor at NAU, Northern Arizona University. Mm-hmm. I have a friend that goes to that school and their dietetics program is actually completely non-diet approach. Wow. I'm incredibly jealous. Yeah. But Dawn Clifford has a book for nutrition professionals specifically on motivational interviewing. So I have her book too. Okay. Yeah. These are people we're going to have to make sure to talk to Abby because there's another Arizona, Megan Niskern. I don't know if you've heard of her, but she is amazing. She actually wrote the SOPs and SOPPs, which is a seven year document through the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. She and April Hackert and Tammy Beasley have written the guides for dietitians who work with eating disorders. So oh. it's this full seven year, it took a long time to write. It's been peer reviewed and it's out now. So in my supervision practice and my groups, I, I provide new documents like that for those of us who are really working in the field and, and wanting to stay current in what's out there. So Don Clifford, mm-hmm. and she has a book for nutrition professionals. Yep. I think it might be called motivational interviewing for nutrition. Okay. And I think that that is a part, a little bit like Molly Kellogg and Molly Kellogg was from my generation more, but I know that she has handbooks and she has some videos and then adding with Dawn, they're both motivational interviewing. But I think that Molly's gone a little more towards internal family systems. That's been her love. I don't know if you're familiar with that modality. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah. IFS for dietitians. So she has some trainings and internal family systems is kind of saying you've got these and with your psychology background, you may be interested in it, but 
this parts of you there's there's the firefighter who's trying to put all the parts out all the fires out and, and running and then there's this other part that is is the child, but there's so many parts of all of us that come to the table whenever we come into a therapy session or a nutrition therapy session that sometimes we hear our clients talk about their different parts. And so Molly has this training for um, IFS for dietitians to help tease that out. That sounds really interesting, actually. I'll have to look into that. Yeah. And how exciting to hear that your friend's school is taking a total non-diet. I know. (laughs) That's what we need more of. Yeah, I know. I was thinking about it. And it was like, if only our professors would mention it as, you know, like a valid approach, because I think what we really need is someone to validate it. Mm -hmm. Um, I can speak as loud as I possibly can but if my peers don't think that it's a valid approach then they might not be willing to listen versus mm-hmm. if they heard it from a professor or someone higher up right and i mean you mentioned like so many people who get into the field that you were coming from nutrition at a from a less healthy perspective mm-hmm. and that's where many dietitians are coming from and why they're interested in the field, why we become interested in the field. And back in the day, it used to be really stigmatized to talk about your own journey through disordered eating or an eating disorder. And nowadays I'm so grateful for so many changes that it's okay. And it's actually can be healing to tell your story and to connect that way, but also understanding your transference and countertransference and what happens in that, in that nutrition therapy office office. Mm-hmm. Kendra, I'm so glad that you volunteered to do this with us. <laughs> and I was just about to say, I think that you having your undergrad in psychology is going to make you the most killer nutrition <laughs> dietitian counselor. I think you're, you're going to be fabulous. I mean, you already are so informed, I, honestly, more so than I feel like I am myself and I'm already a dietitian. So it just goes to show that how much we can really learn from all of each other. But I'm excited for you to get into this field. I think you're going to be amazing. <laughs> well, Abby, when you said that, I was sitting here thinking the same thing. I'm going to watch, we're going to watch Kendra just like rise up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll blow, do my best. <laughs> blow the film. We're going to be riding on your coattails and yes. loving every minute of it. And as you know, my whole thing is I just want the dietetics education. I want people who are thinking about becoming dietitians, people who are, who are thinking about working with eating disorders and disordered eating to really understand how we all got to where we are, which is a lot of training and a lot of signing up for, for webinars and trainings and books and finding out what your own therapeutic modality is as you bring it to your client. Because those of us who have been around for a while and those who have been brought up in the dietetics field, as you, as we all know, we are not really taught this. And so we just kind of come across it as unfulfilling as it becomes to try to have provide quote weight loss conversations or just to hand people papers as they're leaving the hospital, how unfulfilling that is. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And I think just goes to show, you know, I have the utmost respect for all of our professors in undergrad. I had a really, really awesome undergrad experience, but I think goes to show that you almost have to take that extra step. You have to do that additional research. You have to find those other advocates in the field to really become this well-rounded dietitian or even healthcare professional in general. I was just going to say, you have to make sacrifices if you want to learn about this content in depth. I'm actually in class right now. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but this is more important to me. You, know, you have to prioritize the things that will help you to learn in, you know, a certain direction that you want to go. So I just, I mean, I'm, I have permission from my professor. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want have to be the good girl and that, you know, you, I do think this is more important because you're learning things that are kind of general, but we needed from you, like all of the, the things that you've gathered up to make you the person that you are, who, and who you're going to be in this field. I really, really appreciate it. So when does your class end? Is it? 
Oh, it's several hours long. Um, Oh (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh, the Zoom school situation is. It's terrible, isn't it? Yeah. I think, you know, even therapy from the, from the neck up is hard, you know, yeah. and with, I, I'm just going to contrast that to the intuitive eating training that Evelyn moves so quickly. I am just like, wait, I want to rewind you. I, have you started that part of it? I forget you were saying you have a video to watch. Yeah, I'm, I'm starting in April. So I think she records them though. She least, does record so. them, but my gosh, that's like six hours plus hours of there's, there's six sessions that you do. And so to re, I have gone back and I've actually, you know, taken notes and I'm just like, that is the kind of learning I want to have. Not yeah. the one where you're sitting in class and they're ta- droning on and on about something that you're not going to use. <laughs> yeah. The biochemistry of vitamin D. Oh, <laughs> ouch. That gives me PTSD. When you me- when you mentioned organic chemistry, I was like, oh wow, it hurts. <laughs> it hurts. It does. It does. I have um, going back to how you are a personal trainer. So actually, I just became a personal trainer this past Saturday. Passed my tests. Oh. I'm ready to go. But my question for you now is, with this perspective you have on intuitive eating and eating disorders, when you took your personal trainer's course. With the knowledge you have now, did anything stand out like, oh, wow, that's a red flag. We probably shouldn't be saying things that way. Or or what what were your thoughts through that? Oh, my gosh. Okay. So, well, I've been a personal trainer for about four years. So when I became a personal trainer, I was actually not in that healthy mindset quite yet. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, great. I'm going to help people get quote unquote toned and, you know, achieve whatever body they're trying to achieve. I've changed my approach. And so now I call the service that I provide compassionate personal training. And it's more about focusing on the mind body connection, I guess, incorporate some of that yoga training I did too, and helping my clients to make goals like you know, getting stronger and assessing whether or not they need to be getting more rest. And I bring nutrition into that too. So how can we actually fuel you so that you'll have a great session? And how can we help you to best recover afterwards? Yeah, I think that's great. I love, I love, it. I love your label on it. I might, I might mm-hmm. use that myself. Thanks. That's awesome. <laughs> and I think, I think that um, just showing how exercise does does not and really should not be um, doing this because I have to. I'm doing this because I I have to lose weight or whatever that might be. And switching to, this is fun. I love working with Kendra. She's teaching me this. And I love moving my body in this way Mm -hmm. and, and shifting the perspective that way. When I was taking my personal trainer's course, I really thought they did a pretty good job trying to advocate for each professional staying you know, kind of quote unquote in their own lane. So they really were advocating for dietitians. And I thought that was awesome. And I was pleasantly surprised that I was not pushing so much for this is what they have to do to lose weight. It was really coming more weight neutral. So I was curious to see if that was still how it was when you took your course four years ago. Yeah, it's been a while since I actually looked at the materials, but from what I remember, it was just basic nutrition knowledge they gave us. Mm -hmm. And other than that, I I don't even know, I guess they probably mentioned the energy balance equation, but I think that's really it. So it was more focused on exercise science, which is good. Unfortunately, a lot of personal trainers take that certification and use it as a way to say, you know, like, okay, I have this certification that makes me able to speak to things that I'm not necessarily (laughs) qualified to speak to. And that's when people can kind of, you know, get in bad situations. You know, I'm so, I'm just sitting here listening to the two of you. And in my experience of personal trainers, I have to tell them, no, I don't want you to measure my body. I don't want you to do a before and after. I don't want you. I feel like Maybe that's shifting, Abby, from what you're learning, and maybe that's because of the harm that's been done. I would 
I mean, and pie in the sky um, would love to think that that's actually why, but that's really hard to, I, I mean, trying to get my clients to see a personal trainer because they've been harmed by some of that. And if I knew a compassionate body training person, <laughs> um, or, you know, they use that verbiage. Is that, are you coining that as your name or is that kind of, no? Okay. Service. I provide compassion and personal training. Yeah. And that's what, when Abby said, I may use that. I thought, well, if, if it's trademark or if, you know, if that's her yes. actual name, then we would give Kendra all the, we can still give Kendra all the credit yes. um, because that's a beautiful, like if I knew then I would reach out to that person and I would say, here's a client who I feel could use your work. Can we work together to make sure, you know, if, if they're sharing anything, I, I don't know if there's any kind of trauma training, probably not in yoga. There is. There's several um, people online that offer like weight neutral exercise. Lauren Lavelle is one of them. There's this amazing trainer, virtual trainer named Jamie. Her Instagram handle is Fit Ragamuffin, and she's she is hilarious. And she has like classes that you can take. Basically, I think she has a membership you can pay monthly. Nice. But it's all about she doesn't not comment on bodies at all. It's all about how you're feeling and having a good time and just developing like a healthy relationship with fitness. Love it. Love it. So you may also know about the books that have come out recently on uh, one's called gentle nutrition and then unapologetic eating. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of that one? Yeah. Unapologetic eating is unapologetic eating. And then gentle nutrition. She also, I think, is a chef or is trained that way. So yeah, here's the unapologetic eating one. Yay. Brand new came out. And I love her opening. It talks about her on Instagram and getting her picture taken and, and all the comments that were made about the crumbs on her face when she was in a bikini. And it's like, this is just our world, isn't it? And then the gentle nutrition, because when I get to that part with people and, and we're taught as intuitive eating counselors, that is the last one on purpose. It's the last principle because you have to really be able to do that interoceptive, like thinking, paying attention to what your body's asking for before you hop into nutrition, because there are so many rules that we have all been brought up around that you have to unlearn at first before you can learn gentle nutrition. And I love how gentle nutrition so I know I'm giving a plug for them too, but basically there's no serving sizes. I mean, they give generalities like this recipe will make four to six servings, but there, you know, it helps with that rigidity that so many people have, like, what's the right amount for me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually I had someone recently ask me online is eating using your, the palm of your hand. Like, should I be using portion sizes in that way? And <laughs> it's just it's not common knowledge that it's okay to actually just eat like it's okay to not measure anything and to just go with what sounds good to you and what you think will make your body feel good it's a new concept to so many people I love that example because that's it is it's it's a starting point even like when you mentioned energy balance those formulas are serious starting points and that's it because if you've been messing with your metabolism for years, you may be hypometabolic and it's going to take a while for your body to actually recognize that you're going to give it nutrition so it can move again. And then when you mention the word should anytime, and that's what I've been trained is anytime someone says should, that that's a, that can be attached to a shame, something like I should, I should be doing this. Shouldn't I be using my palm? And so we get to unpack the word should like, well, why should you use the palm of your hand? And so why is that label if it says six crackers and you have seven or you have three, like, why should you have six? So the word should relates to so many other things. Like I should be doing this. I should be exercising more. I should be studying harder. I shouldn't be <laughs> whatever. We get to connect that to them and kind of point out, why should you? Or when people say, I'm sorry, so many times, it's like, why are you saying you're sorry? You're Okay, thank you so much. 
You guys are giving me so many books. I, I need. I know, to, right? That's I the want. thing, Abby. When you and I when came up with this, and I'm like, we are going to learn so much. But now I've got two pages of things from Kendra. <laughs> I, I don't know how much time there is in the day. Yeah, <laughs> Wind the group Wind. wind yes, nutrition dietetics. They actually have a page on their site that just has a list of recommended books. So I think that's where I originally started. Mm-hmm. Um, and they have a symposium every year too, right? Yeah, they do. Mm-hmm. And they just finished it or they're just starting it. I don't remember. Yeah, early March. So they're probably planning for the next one, I guess. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much. Is there anything else, Kendra, that you would like us to know that you would like to highlight? How can people find you? What it's your Instagram handles or how do you want people to get involved in, in the dietetics groups that you're talking about? Just give us details on how to find you. So you can find me on Instagram. My handle is Kendra in the kitchen, periods in between the words. And the anti-diet dietetics students Instagram handle is at anti-diet dietetic students, also with periods between the words. Yeah, I think that's it. All right. Thank you so much. And we're going to, we're going to watch those handles grow and we're going to watch um, when you become a registered dietitian and all the things that you're doing with all the knowledge that you have. Thank yeah. you so much. Thanks Thank for having you. us. It's really awesome to get to know you and just hear you speak when you came to speak with my internship. I think that it was really validating to hear you speak on the non-diet approach and intuitive eating because you you kind of question yourself. You're like, is this a valid approach? Because nobody's talking about it. And then, you know, someone like you in this position that you're in, it's, it's just very, very helpful to hear. Oh, that is, that is good. I'm glad to hear. I never, you never know what's on people's minds when they're on the receiving side of that. So that little nugget is really helpful to me. Let's lean on each other and learn from each other so we can grow together as professionals in this field of eating disorders. If you want to connect with me for supervision or membership with monthly content, please find me at bethharrell.com slash professionals.